You're so dumb. Can't you do this more efficiently? It's frustrating just watching you. The harassment for my sister-in-law, Michelle, escalated day by day. It even started to interfere with my work from home. But I didn't break, because there was a job I desperately wanted to complete. My name is Amanda Smith, 29 years old. Working as a contract employee for a certain company, I live modestly with my dad, taking over the household chores to relieve my busy dad. He raced through life without a break, raising a daughter on his own. Gradually, I wanted to ease his burden a bit. When I was still in elementary school, Dad placed his large hand on my head and said, You don't have to try so hard with the housework. Use your time as you like. That makes me happier. Dad was always kind and generous, no matter how tired he was. Secretly, I wished for his happiness. I hope Dad will find great happiness someday. This small wish came true a few years ago. Dad's new wife was named Barbara. Barbara, with her daughter Michelle, moved into the house where Dad and I lived. Barbara was honest and kind-hearted, a wonderful woman. In contrast, her daughter Michelle was prideful and cunning. It didn't take long for Michelle, initially quiet and reserved, to show her true colors. That day as usual, I prepared lunch for Dad and sent him off to work. Barbara was away on a business trip since yesterday. Michelle, a college student, should have had lectures today. I decided to prepare her lunch before she woke up. Even with four in the family, I still managed all the household chores. Working from home, I had some flexibility, and I didn't mind cleaning or cooking. It was a nice break from work, refreshing my mind. Barbara, now my stepmother, said, I feel bad having you do everything. But I assured her I enjoyed it. By the time I set breakfast for Michelle and me on the table, I heard her coming down the stairs. Groggy Michelle entered the living room, and I greeted her. Good morning. Breakfast is ready. Your lunch is on the table, too. Feel free to take it. Michelle paused and said, I'm not going to college today. Huh? But your calendar said you had lectures. They were rescheduled later. I updated the calendar. Didn't you see it? Ah, uh, sorry, haven't checked yet. In our house, where lifestyles greatly differ, we decided to write down schedules on a shared calendar. I'm still not used to this new habit and sometimes forget to check. Michelle sighed heavily and muttered, <sighs> You're really clumsy, before returning to her room. I didn't take her words too seriously, assuming she was just cranky from waking up. Two weeks passed since then. After days of relentless rain, it finally cleared up on a sunny Saturday morning. Feeling refreshed, I was hanging laundry when I sensed Michelle, who had slept in getting up. But something was noisy. She rushed from the bathroom to the upstairs, then hurried back down, looking around the living room. Hey, where's my skirt? Michelle's demanding tone was suddenly directed at me. Skirt? If you mean the one in the laundry basket yesterday, I'm about to hang it. No, the one I asked you to wash separately two days ago. I told you at dinner, remember? Oh, that one. It had a small tear, so I decided to mend it before washing separately. I finished mending it last night, and it's in the washer now. What? Didn't you listen to me? I said I needed it washed early, because I'm wearing it today. Are you even listening? Uh, I was at a loss for words. Indeed, she had asked to wash that long skirt separately, but I wasn't informed she needed it today. I recalled our conversation from two nights ago. I want to wear it next Saturday, so please wash it by then. Next as in next week? Yeah, yeah, don't make me repeat myself. Michelle ended the conversation abruptly, playing with her phone. That's when the misunderstanding occurred. And it was Michelle who hadn't listened properly. Though I had no reason to be blamed, I didn't want to argue and said, Sorry, I misunderstood the date. But Michelle, standing before me, glared with a disdainful look. Think an apology solves everything? 
This is why I hate dumb people. Having a high school graduate sister is just unbearable. Can't even manage household stuff properly. Michelle attends an elite university known nationwide. Our worlds are different. Yet, I had hoped we'd get along, now that we're family. Just to be clear, I never thought of you as family from the start. Michelle said mockingly, with a disturbing smile. Seeing that expression, I felt an eerie chill. From that day, Michelle's disdain towards me became more apparent in her actions. When I worked from home, loud music blared from Michelle's room. Not just disrupting my work, but loud enough to be a nuisance to the neighbors. Could you lower the volume a bit? The neighbors might complain. I asked timidly, but she retorted. What? Don't boss me around. I'm annoyed by the typing sounds from your room. She slammed the door in my face. On another day, Michelle brought friends home and said loudly, Isn't it embarrassing having a high school graduate sister who can't even get a decent job? I wish she'd move out soon. One of her friends, leaving, jokingly said to my door, Sorry for disturbing. Michelle feels sorry for you, so please move out soon, okay? <laughs> her friends laughed as they passed my room. These harassments always happened when our parents were away. In front of Dad and Barbara, Michelle played the role of a good sister, eerily amicable towards me. Before long, Michelle graduated from university and secured a job at a major corporation. Within a year, she got engaged to her company's superior. By then, I had moved out to live alone, freeing myself from daily harassments and gradually regaining a peaceful life. One day, an invitation to Michelle's wedding arrived. The ceremony was to be held overseas. <sighs> Sighing, I placed the invitation on a nearby table. About three months later, I boarded a plane from Los Angeles International Airport to France. Since moving out, I had become distant from my family. I was worried about Dad, but Barbara was with him. Without me in that house, Michelle wouldn't cause trouble. To preserve Dad's happiness, I wanted to avoid family conflicts. It was better to keep my distance from Michelle and minimize visits to my family home. To Dad and Barbara, I said I moved out to focus on my career. Despite the suddenness, they respected my decision, telling me, Don't worry about home. Just do what you think is right. Yes, you should pursue what you want. It's a once-in-a-lifetime chance, they said with a smile. It's true, Michelle's actions affected my work, but that wasn't the only reason I left. I felt it was time to confront my own life and take a new step. On the night before Michelle's wedding, in my hotel room, checking the dress and belongings for the next day, my phone rang. Michelle's name appeared on the screen. A bad feeling washed over me. Hesitantly, I answered the phone. It was Michelle's voice after several months. Hey, long time no see. Where are you right now? Um, in a hotel in Paris. There was a brief pause in the conversation. Then, laughter erupted from the other end. <laughs> really went, huh? Are you stupid? How crazy can you be? What do you mean? The overseas wedding was a lie. Fooled you as expected. I'll send the real invitation later, okay? By the way, if you don't show up, I'll ruin something very dear to you. The call ended there. I sat weakly on the bed. Michelle had played a cruel trick on me, and she might be planning another scheme. Additionally, Michelle said, Moreover, she threatened to ruin what's most important to me if I didn't attend. Such an act could harm not just me, but Dad and Barbara as well. Michelle could easily do something like that. The peace I had regained seemed to crumble in my mind. As long as Michelle and I are family, the situation will continue. I have no choice but to meekly follow Michelle's actions. Always. Then my thoughts abruptly stopped. Why did I leave home? 
Wasn't it to fully pursue what I wanted? I haven't achieved anything yet. Instead of feeling weak, I should work to change the situation. Even someone like me can find a way to stand up to Michelle. I rose from the bed and reached for the curtains by the window. Outside the glass, the Parisian night unfolded. Life is strange. Sometimes when wandering in the dark, the path forward is illuminated and becomes clear. This was one of those moments. I closed the curtains, turned off the light, and slid into bed. The earlier anxiety had vanished, replaced by a soothing drowsiness. I closed my eyes slowly. Eventually, I spent about a week in France, taking the opportunity to enjoy sightseeing before returning home. Recharged, I returned to the U.S. and threw myself into work. Forgetting to eat and sleep, I spent days glued to my computer. My mind ran at full speed, devouring documents and typing furiously. After two months of this lifestyle, I visited a specific place. Walking down the main street in front of the station, I entered one of the buildings. Exiting the elevator on the third floor, I knocked on the first door down the hall. A soft female voice invited me in from inside. In my tote bag was a thick file at home. Inside was a large amount of copy paper that I had printed out at home. I intended to hand these to someone. As I touched the doorknob, a wave of nervousness made my fingers tremble. It's okay, I've done everything I could. Now it was up to fate. I calmed myself down and quietly stepped into the room. On the day of Michelle's wedding, I had called the venue to inform them of my absence. Michelle probably thought I underestimated her, that high school graduate fool. Prideful Michelle, always needing to feel superior. But now I understood. Michelle lacked something vital, something I possessed, but she did not. A knock on the dressing room door, and a man peeked in. Excuse me, it's almost time. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. I'll be right out. I picked up a Western book from beside me and left the room. At the same time, Michelle's wedding reception was underway. Stephen, her husband, was the son of a corporate president. Among the guests were some notable figures, and Michelle was inwardly proud. While everyone enjoyed the grand food and friends' performances, a man discreetly approached Stephen. After whispering something, Stephen said to Michelle, Amanda isn't coming today. She appeared on TV. Did you know? Michelle was taken aback, clueless. Looking towards the guests, she noticed some commotion among Stephen's invitees. It was also streamed online. Seems to be quite a topic. A colleague from Michelle's company nearby was heard speaking on her phone. I've read this book too. Just released last month and already going for a reprint? It's a foreign sci-fi novel. The author passed away long ago, but it turns out it's written by a globally renowned scientist. Someone started saying online. Another colleague at the same table mentioned, That's the one that's been trending on social media recently, right? It's got futuristic, predictive scenes, and a friend told me it's interesting. A translator named Amanda Smith. She was on a show today at noon. Amanda Smith? Isn't that Michelle's sister-in-law's name? Hearing this, Michelle immediately opened her mobile phone. A search on her timeline brought up my name. The top article read, Historic scientist posthumous work discovered. Interview with translator Amanda Smith on her encounter with the book. The wedding venue was already buzzing with this news. Amid the commotion, the ceremony soon concluded. After changing in the dressing room, Michelle stepped into the hallway to see her parents and Stephen. Along with Stephen's parents, in a tense atmosphere. Such an embarrassment, being the subject of harassment. We were clueless, and now we don't even know how to respond to inquiries from acquaintances. Said Daniel, Stephen's father, and the head of a major corporation, in a stern tone. I've dined with Michelle numerous times, but she never once mentioned her sister-in-law, Amanda. Are they on bad terms? 
I value family bonds, you know. I was lenient because Stephen seemed smitten. But I hear some women at the company don't think highly of Michelle. Do you think I know nothing? Finally, Daniel added, You better make this right. Call Amanda immediately. Arrange for me to meet her directly. If you can't reach Amanda, consider this marriage null and void. Undoing a marriage was easy for someone like Daniel. If the marriage were called off after such a grand ceremony, it would severely tarnish Michelle's reputation. She'd be too embarrassed to face her colleagues, and her friends would surely ridicule her. Michelle, pale-faced, frantically pulled out her mobile phone. First call, second call, only the hollow ring. Fifth call, the number you are trying to reach is not answering. An automated voice responded. Maybe she's blocked you, her father suggested. No way. Amanda must just be busy, Michelle defended. Skipping a day on the wedding itself is not normal, unless there's an accident or illness, especially for family. I don't want to invite more trouble into my home. A woman like you, prone to problems, is clearly not suitable for our family. Daniel concluded. But the ceremony is already over. Stephen, don't just stand there. Say something. Michelle looked at Stephen with her characteristic pleading eyes, but Stephen turned away, refusing to look at her. At that moment, Michelle realized something. Her parents, standing behind her, were silent, just observing. They could have defended their daughter, but hadn't said a word. Mom, it's not my fault, right? Tell them it's not my fault. Barbara smiled ruefully and said, Actually, I got a call from Amanda yesterday. She said she couldn't make it to the wedding for some reasons. It's a long story, but you'll understand soon. It might be inconvenient for both of you, but she asked for forgiveness just this once. It's a big moment in her life. That's what Amanda said. What do you mean? You knew about today? You knew and didn't tell me? Yes, exactly. If I had told you, you would have interfered, right? After all the trouble you've caused Amanda, you never learn. Really, you're impossible. I failed as a mother. Michelle listened with a defiant expression. We thought if you experienced some hardship, you'd understand. So Dad and I discussed it, and as bad as we felt for Amanda, we decided to turn a blind eye. It seems this is a family matter. We as outsiders should leave. Someone interjected. Wait, please. We're not done here. I'll bring Amanda, I promise. Please reconsider, Daniel. I don't want to be addressed by my name by you. Do you want to anger me further? Even Michelle fell silent under Daniel's stern gaze. This time, she had picked the wrong battle. She watched dazed as Stephen and his parents walked away. Michelle, tasting her biggest defeat, finally realized her emptiness. After successfully appearing on the TV show, I was dining with an acquaintance. A French dinner at a luxurious hotel. Across from me sat Pamela, a dignified, calm, elderly lady. I chose this place to celebrate. I wonder if a more casual setting would have been better. No, I'm really grateful. It's my first time dining somewhere like this, so I'm a bit nervous. I like your honesty. Just be yourself. I don't like formalities either. Enjoy the meal to the fullest. Pamela's titles included French literature researcher, translator, and translation school lecturer. She was also my mentor. I once found an old Western book among Mom's belongings. Dad said its origin was unknown. It appeared to be a novel written in French. There were notes throughout, indicating Mom had read it repeatedly. I remembered how Mom hummed foreign songs while cooking or doing laundry. It happened before I could remember, so I don't remember it clearly. Could those lyrics have been in French? I started reading the book bit by bit, translating with a dictionary, and got absorbed in its world. I became enchanted with the French language. 
I devoured French books and translated my favorites. I was so engrossed that I lost track of time. After becoming a working adult, I started attending translation school during nights and weekends. One of my teachers, impressed by my language skills, introduced me to translation work. I was delighted to take it on, especially since it could be done from home. Around the same time, Dad decided to remarry. Even with the increased family size, my work wasn't affected, except for the issues with Michelle. I was surprised when you handed me a thick manuscript. Your translation skills were professional level, and the novel had a unique world view. I had been translating for years, but I was never quite satisfied with my work. It took a long time, but completing it helped me grow mentally. Yes, translation is a battle with oneself. Each completed work feels like shedding a skin. It's fascinating. I agree. That's why I can't stop. Pamela smiled warmly upon hearing my words. It's a blessing to have something you want to pursue passionately in life. When I returned home after a long time, Barbara greeted me. Dad was still busy with work, coming home late as usual. I heard footsteps coming down from upstairs. Ah, finally awake. Michelle, you have a part-time job today. After the wedding cancellation and leaving her job, Michelle seemed to have been staying home. Barbara had told her, How long will you sulk? Do you want to live miserably like this forever? If you don't want to start over, you better leave this house. Worried about being kicked out, Michelle reluctantly started looking for part-time work and settled on a grocery store clerk position. As Michelle passed by the living room, she glanced at me awkwardly and hurried out the door. Amanda, you're going overseas for work, right? You said something about a potential contract with a new author? Yes, it looks like it's going to be finalized, but they want to meet in person. That's great. I'm relieved to hear your translation work is going well. Take care, and I'm looking forward to the souvenirs. Barbara's innocent smile made me smile, too. Continuing to do what I love is enough for me. I thought it was that simple. My ability to become a translator was because I maintained a pure heart. It's a gift from Mom in heaven. A talent to enjoy life to the fullest. On my way back from my parents' house, I passed by a dogwood tree. Stopping to look, I saw many buds waiting to bloom. Surely, I'm just getting started too. Blooming one flower at a time, I'll continue on my path. As the gentle spring breeze blew, I started walking again. My dad and mom will be staying with us for two weeks starting this weekend, my husband casually declared after returning from work. Without even bothering to ask me, he would unilaterally decide when his parents would visit, and I had reached my limit with his arrogance. Wait, wait a minute, again? They were just here last month, weren't they? What's your problem? Are you treating my parents as if they're intruders? That's not what I meant. You're my wife, and all you need to do is make them feel welcome. My husband treats me like a housemaid. It seems like he didn't care about how I felt. I can't bear this kind of life anymore. Just because they're my in-laws, it doesn't mean that I should tolerate everything. I'm definitely going to escape from this situation. My name is Judy. I'm 30 years old. Three years ago, I married my co-worker and resigned from my job when we got married. I want you to be a full-time housewife and support family. My husband asked me, so I became a homemaker. Two years after we got married, I became pregnant. Currently, I'm living busy days, raising our one-year-old daughter, Alice. My husband's name is Kyle, who is also 30 years old. Recently, he seems to be in line for a promotion at his company. Due to this, he's been working a lot of overtime and weekend shifts, so we seldom have time as a family. Normally, he'd contact me if he's going to be late, but on this day... He hadn't come home even when it was 8 p.m. I became worried and texted him, but there was no response. After waiting anxiously, he finally came home just after midnight. You're still up. Uh, why didn't you respond even once? I messaged you so many times. I couldn't help it, right? I was doing overtime. Overtime? No matter how busy you are, couldn't you at least send a single text saying, 
I'm doing overtime and will be late? I was worried because there was no response from you at all. Judy, you're being overly dramatic. Stop making such a fuss just because I got home a little late. What's with that tone? I was worried about you. It seemed my worries are not reaching him at all. Kyle just responded with the flat, yeah, yeah, sorry about that, and headed to the bathroom. He wasn't always like this. The changes in Kyle began after our daughter was born a year ago. That being said, I believe Kyle was genuinely happy about Alice's birth. Although he wasn't present during the delivery, he came to the hospital right after she was born. Both sets of parents were delighted, and I still remember how truly happy we were. The following month after Alice's birth, the in-laws came to stay with us, and they stayed for two whole weeks. I was exhausted, mentally and physically, from my single-handed newborn baby care, but Kyle decided to invite the in-laws without consulting me. Of course, I firmly protested. But Kyle persisted. My folks just want to see their grandchild. He didn't care about my opinions. Whenever I showed any signs of displeasure, he would respond with even more irritation. And he would always spit out the same line. Are you treating my parents like they're in your way? He said. That was the trigger. And from that point on, the in-laws began to stay at our house for two weeks, almost every month. While they played with Alice, they did not lift a finger to help with household chores. I was the only one who had to take care of their laundry, meals, and everything on top of looking after Alice. Kyle was often coming home late due to overtime and away working on weekends, so dealing with his parents fell entirely onto me. The additional burden was unbearable as I was already overwhelmed with taking care of Alice. Nevertheless, that day, Kyle casually announced, Oh, by the way, my folks are coming to stay again this weekend. Wait a minute, again? They were just here last month. What, are you treating my parents like they're in the way? That's not what I... Anyway, you're my wife and you should host them nicely. Kyle never agreed with my opinions and my frustrations kept piling up day by day. But thinking of my little daughter, I couldn't just leave him. At that time, all I could do was silently accept what he said. A few days later, as usual... My husband left for work, and the doorbell rang just after 10 a.m. <sighs> Here they are again. Considering Kyle is at work, it would be nicer if they could at least come late in the afternoon or even in the evening. Holding these grievances within, I opened the front door. Sure enough, there stood my in-laws. Somehow I managed to force a smile. Good morning, father, mother. Hey there, Judy. Here we are again. Where's little Alice? Let me hold her right away. Alice is in her room, but she just fell asleep. What? She's sleeping? Then I'll hold her. Wait a minute, dear. I'm the one who should hold her first. As they engaged in this banter, they barged into the house. They lifted Alice, sleeping peacefully in her crib, and started a tug of war over her. I tried to stop them. She's sleeping. But they paid no heed. Crying out over who gets to hold Alice, they ended up waking her up with the noise. And then, of course, Alice started crying. As soon as Alice started crying, the in-laws thrusted her back at me. Oh, she's crying again. This kid cries all the time, doesn't she? Yeah, really. Kyle didn't cry this much. Judy, are you sure you're giving her enough love? Of course I am. I couldn't stand their comments any longer, so I chimed in. She usually sleeps just fine. She's crying now because the two of you were shouting over her. What? Are you trying to say it's our fault? Oh, goodness, Judy, that's a harsh thing to say. We're here trying to dote on our granddaughter, and instead of thanking us, you complain. I didn't mean to complain. It's just that now I've got a bad taste in my mouth. I'm feeling a bit peckish, too. Can you make us something? Well, I'm going to take a break. Judy, can you brew us some tea? Oh, and don't forget the cookies. Despite Alice crying at the top of her lungs, they behave just like that. If they're hungry, they could eat outside. If they want tea, they could brew it themselves. Even though I thought that in my heart, I couldn't say it out loud. I stood in the kitchen holding my sobbing daughter and catered to my in-laws' demands. For the next two weeks, I was busy without a break. My in-laws, and of course, my husband, didn't help with the housework at all. 
Eventually, I couldn't bear it anymore, and the night my in-laws left, I complained to my husband. Hey, about your parents, can't they reduce the frequency of their visits a bit? What are you talking about? You're saying you don't like my parents coming? My husband immediately retorted, and I was taken aback. It's not that I dislike it. I just think they visit too often. Plus, staying for two weeks, that's way too long. It's just two weeks, isn't it? Besides, they don't come every month. Don't complain too much. My husband sighed deeply and didn't even try to make eye contact with me. Nothing was going to be changed for the better. I thought, and I pleaded with him again. Listen to me. Seriously. I'm busy taking care of Alice, and it's tough to also take care of your parents on top of it. Kyle, you don't even help me at all, and I've got too much on my shoulders. Huh? Don't talk like my parents are a burden. They're taking care of Alice, and I can't believe you can say such a thing. Taking care? As soon as Alice cries, they push her on to me. You're always like that, Kyle. Just doting on her when you're in a good mood, and you're not really caring for her. <sighs> Give me a break. Do you realize who you and Alice are living off of? What? Why do you have to bring it up? I became a housewife because you wanted me to, Kyle. Shut up. Isn't it the fact that you're living off my money? Stop complaining and properly treat my parents. His loud shouting voice woke up Alice. Immediately, Alice started to cry, and he left the room with an annoyed look on his face. Why? How can he make such a face to his own daughter? It's his fault that Alice woke up in the first place, because he was shouting. Can't he help with housework and childcare just a little? I had nowhere to direct my anger and frustration, and tears welled up in my eyes. Hidden by the sound of my daughter's cries, I wept quietly. Even after that, my relationship with my husband didn't improve, and the days passed by. It had been a while. Around that time, I received a phone call from my mother who lives far away. Hello, Judy. Do you have any plans this weekend? No plans in particular. What's up? Well, actually, there's a funeral of a friend nearby. I haven't seen Alice for so long. I was thinking I'd like to visit. Really? I'd be so happy. Please come visit. Oh, I'm glad. If it's not too much trouble, could I possibly stay for one night? Of course. I'll let Kyle know. The unexpected news of my mother's visit filled me with joy. What should we eat? What should we talk about? I was filled with anticipation. But when I told my husband about my mother's visit when he got home, he returned an unexpected answer. Huh? What are you talking about? That's out of the question. Wait, wait a minute. Why is it out of the question? This weekend, my mom and dad are coming over. We don't have room to accommodate your mother. I don't want to be bothered either. Huh? Your parents are coming again? Stop saying again. We should be grateful they're even coming. Huh? Grateful? What is he talking about? I don't see how this is something to be grateful for when it only adds to my burden. Normally, I would back down to avoid a fight, but I couldn't give in this time. I made up my mind and once again confronted him. Isn't it strange? Why is it fine for your parents, but not for my mother? Huh? Well, of course the husband's parents come first. What? That's not fair. And the ratio is off. Your parents are here nearly every month, but my mother can't even come once a year? Since Alice was born, my mother hasn't seen her. Well, send her some photos or something. She doesn't need to come all the way. She's only coming because she has a funeral to attend. It's only for one night. Why do you always prioritize your parents so much? You're the worst. The words I blurted out, you're the worst, seemed to have struck a nerve. He furrowed his brows and glared at me. You, you'd better watch out your attitude. I, I just meant just for one day we could have my mother. Enough. I'm the one paying for the rent, the groceries, all the living expenses. In other words, I get to decide who gets to come to this house. Shut up and do as I say, you parasite. At that moment, all the frustrations I had been suppressing exploded. All I asked was to host my mother for just one day. And yet, why do I have to be berated like this? And a parasite? Really? How could he say such a thing? Who does he think does all the housework while he's out making money? Enough is enough. I'll show him. It was at that moment that I decided to divorce my husband. To set an appropriate stage for it, just a little more patience was needed. 
I ended up explaining the situation to my mother and told her we couldn't host her. The weekend arrived and the in-laws came. My husband, unusually, had no work that day. Thanks for hosting us again, Judy. Is Alice awake yet? Yes, she's awake. Oh, what perfect timing. Let me hold her. Like always, the in-laws stormed into our house without any hesitation. My husband just sat there, grinning like a fool. While I was preparing some tea, my mother-in-law and husband approached me, grinning. Judy, we always feel bad, but since we help look after Alice like this, you must be grateful, right? Absolutely. It's all thanks to Mom and Dad. Oh, by the way, Judy, this time they're staying for three weeks. That's fine. This will be the last time, anyway. Upon hearing my reply, my husband and his parents let out a synchronized, Huh? After a moment of shock, my husband frantically asked, Hey, Judy, what the hell are you saying? What do you mean by the last time? I mean exactly what I said. I can't deal with you all anymore. What? Don't joke with me. If you keep talking like that, I'll divorce you. Fine. What? Here you go. I handed him the divorce papers I had filled out in advance. The color drained from Kyle's face as I thrust the papers at him. What the hell is this? A joke, right? <laughs> Do you think I'd joke about this? I'm serious. I've told my mom, and I've decided to leave this house and go back to my parents' home. What? I won't let you do that. We are not getting a divorce. Even his parents joined in as I stood there in silence. What Kyle says is right. You've been leeching off of him, and now you're acting all high and mighty. You're living off Kyle, and yet you're taking this attitude even with us. The three of them started hurling insults at me one after another but I no longer needed to endure it. They are no longer my family or anything else to me. Taking a deep breath, I let them have it. Enough with you and your goddamn bullshit. You think just because I'm quiet, you can say whatever you want? Do you have any idea how much I've had to put up with? <sighs> it was the first time I've ever talked back like this in front of them. So all three of them were taken aback. Eventually, Kyle started opening and closing his mouth as if he wanted to say something, but I didn't let him and continued. I wouldn't wish to be part of a family like yours anymore. Taking care of Alice? You're just intruding for your own satisfaction. Just holding her when she's in a good mood doesn't mean you're looking after her. Well, wait, Judy, let's calm down a bit. Shut up. Since Alice was born, how many times have you changed her diaper, fed her a bottle, bathed her? You're just messing around with her when she's in a good mood. You let your parents stay over all the time, but not my mom? That's bullshit. Why should only your parents be treated so well? I've had enough of babysitting you three. My outburst left the three of them standing there in shock. Having vented all my grievances, I grabbed my bare essentials, picked up Alice, and left the house. I then headed straight for my parents' house. I had already told my parents about the situation so they warmly welcomed me. I ignored all the calls and emails from Kyle. If he refuses to agree to the divorce, I'm considering going for mediation. The divorce will most likely proceed on the grounds of his fault, because I discovered his affair. The woman he was cheating with was a colleague from the company where I used to work. One of my ex-colleagues who had worked at the same place as him told me about the affair and even provided photos as evidence. All his claims of working late or on weekends were lies. No wonder he gradually became distant after Alice was born. Based on the evidence of the affair, I hired a lawyer, and eventually the divorce was finalized. I was able to collect the agreed-on alimony from Kyle. Of course, I reported the affair to our company, and both my ex-husband and his mistress were fired. Their relationship seemed to have quickly fizzled out due to this, and they parted ways. Having lost his job, and with the alimony payment creating a debt, I heard that he's now constantly being hounded by debt collectors. His parents, my former in-laws, who used to rely on him, are apparently now having a harder life than before. I don't have a shred of sympathy for them, since it's all a product of their own actions. As for me, I've been raising my daughter, with the support of my parents at our family home. There are tough times, sure, but... Thanks to my parents' help, we're managing to lead a peaceful life. My daughter is only a year old. There will come a day when she'll wonder about her father. When that day comes, 
I'll explain everything to her in words that she can understand. I plan to pour all the love I can into my daughter for as long as I can. Welcome home. Dinner's ready. But do you want to shower first? Hey, are you listening? Here we go again. When he's in a bad mood, my husband Lloyd ignores me. I'm used to it, but it still doesn't feel good. This time, however, was different. His mood usually improves in a few days, but this time it lasted for weeks. And he even ignored our daughter, Nina. I have to do something for Nina's sake. Just when I was thinking this, Nina came up with an unexpected suggestion. My name is Maya, and I'm 33 years old. Lloyd and I are the same age, and we've been married for seven years. Shortly after getting married, we were blessed with a child, and Nina was born. Nina is about to start elementary school, and she seems to be growing up fast. Every day when she comes home from the child care center, she tells me about her day. Hey, Mom, today I drew pictures with Nancy. Oh, that sounds fun. Did you enjoy it? Yes, I drew pictures of Mom, Dad, and Nina. I'll show it to Dad later. He'll be thrilled, I'm sure. I wish Dad would come home soon. Lloyd had been working late a lot lately. We used to have dinner together. But these days, it's often just Nina and me. Nina understands that Lloyd is busy, but she's still a little lonely. I can tell from the things she says and her expressions. Several hours later, close to midnight, Lloyd finally came home. Ah, welcome back, Lloyd. Dinner's ready, but do you want to shower first? Hey, are you listening? And it starts again. When Lloyd is in a bad mood, he ignores me like this. No matter what I ask, he won't respond. But I can't just leave it at that. If Lloyd is going to eat, I have to prepare dinner. If not, I have to put it away. I asked him again as he tiredly took off his suit. So Lloyd, what about dinner? If you're not eating, I'll put it in the fridge. Lloyd, what are you going to do? Enough is enough. If you don't want anything, I'm putting it away. As I was about to get up from my chair, Lloyd went to the fridge, took out a beer, and started drinking. That's his signal for me to prepare dinner. <sighs> I sighed, but reheated the food and set it in front of him. Not a word of thanks. He won't even make eye contact. I'm used to it, but it's not a good feeling. It's infuriating to be treated like this. Still, I do my minimum duty as a wife, all for Nina's sake. Lloyd may ignore me when he's in a bad mood, but he's a good dad in front of Nina. No matter how cold he is to me, he always responds when Nina talks to him. He used to play with her when he got home from work, and he'd often take her out on his days off. To him, being a good dad for Nina, I do my best to support him as his wife and I do everything I can to improve his mood, even if it's just a little bit sooner. Lloyd eats the dinner I prepared in silence, so I quietly say to him, I'm going to bed. Good night. Of course, there's no response from him. Even though I know this, it's lonely not to have even basic conversations. How long will this last this time? It's been as long as two or three days before. I'm tired from work, too, so I hope Lloyd's mood improves soon. With that thought, I fall asleep. The next day, as I'm preparing breakfast, Lloyd walks into the living room. Good morning, Maya and Nina. It seems his mood has improved. I'm relieved it happened so quickly, and I respond with a, Good morning! Nina, happy to talk to Lloyd in the morning, runs to him with a big smile. Dad! I want to go to the amusement park. Amusement park, huh? Sure, let's go on the next long weekend. Really? Are you sure? Yeah, let's make it a family outing. Yay, I love you, Dad. Haha, <laughs> Dad loves you too, Nina. Lloyd lifts Nina up and smiles happily. 
Nina is also thrilled about the promise to go to the amusement park. He was so moody yesterday, but now he's completely back to normal. And he's also communicating well with Nina. I decide to let last night's incident slide. For a while after that, Lloyd's good mood continues. He comes home late, but there's nothing particularly upsetting, and we spend our days relatively peacefully. Today, Lloyd is working late again. After putting Nina to bed and waiting, he walks into the living room past 11 p.m. Welcome back. Dinner's ready. Uh, Lloyd? Here we go again. And today, his expression is clearly tense. It's obvious that he's in a bad mood. To avoid making it worse, I quickly prepare some beer and snacks. But Lloyd, perhaps disliking my anticipatory actions, glances at the food I prepared and heads straight for the shower. Despite Nina sleeping, he slams the door shut. What's going on? I went out of my way to prepare this for him. If you're not going to eat, at least say something. I have work too, and I'm basically raising our child on my own. I was already tired, and my irritation was reaching its limit. I'll just go to sleep today. Just as I was heading to the bedroom, a notification sound came from Lloyd's discarded suit. It was already past midnight. Who could it be at this hour? Curiosity overcame my anger towards Lloyd, and I cautiously checked his phone. What? What is this? The sender of the text was registered as Anita. It was immediately clear that she was someone Lloyd was having an affair with. Can't wait to see you after work today. Sure, let's meet at our usual spot. I'll tell my wife I'm working late. You're such a bad boy, Lloyd. You're married too, Anita. Same difference. <laughs> True, as long as we don't get caught. The last text read, I think I'm going to end this. My husband is getting suspicious. I felt nauseous looking at the unbelievable exchange. I can't believe it. He's been lying all this time. All those late nights were because he was meeting her. Checking the dates, it seemed they had fought on the days Lloyd had been ignoring me. So that's why he was in such a bad mood today. I wanted to smash Lloyd's phone, but that would destroy the evidence. I took photos of the text exchange with my phone and put his phone back in his suit pocket. Normally, I'd confront Lloyd as soon as he came out of the bathroom and make him confess everything. But if I did that now, I'd just end up yelling at him. It's late, and Nina is asleep. I don't want to upset her over some stupid marital spat. I'll ask my parents to look after Nina soon. Then I can have a proper talk with Lloyd. With that decision, I chose to sleep silently that night. In the end, Lloyd's silent treatment lasted a whole week. Probably because his fight with his affair partner was dragging on. But he was still kind to Nina during that time so I didn't probe further. Then one day, as I was preparing breakfast and talking to Nina, Lloyd woke up. His expression was gloomy, and it was unclear whether his mood had improved. To check, I greeted him cheerfully. Good morning, Lloyd. Breakfast will be ready soon. Do you want fried eggs or scrambled eggs? It seemed Lloyd's mood hadn't improved yet. He completely ignored me and sulked while fiddling with his phone. Nina was nearby, so I suppressed my rising anger and pretended to be calm. Then Nina, who had been watching the exchange, asked me curiously, Mom, it seems like Dad can't hear you. Uh, yes, it looks like Dad is still sleepy. Really? But you're talking to him so close. Can't he hear? Well, that's, um... As I struggled to respond to Nina's innocent question, she turned to Lloyd and spoke loudly. Dad, Mom is asking you, do you want fried eggs or scrambled eggs? I was honestly relieved by Nina's actions. Even if Lloyd ignores me, he never ignores Nina. If Nina asks, he has to answer. That's what I thought, 
but today was different. Silence lingered, and Lloyd didn't respond. Nina kept asking him, Hey, Dad, are you listening? Choose between fried eggs and scrambled eggs. Mom can't prepare it if you don't decide. Come on, Dad, stop looking at your phone and answer my question. The next moment, Nina clung to Lloyd's leg. Tsk! Lloyd let out an exaggerated sigh towards Nina. What? Is this a joke? Is he planning to ignore Nina, too? He started changing without saying a word and left for work. The front door slammed shut, echoing loudly. At that moment, an indescribable rage surged through me. Unbelievable! Is he ignoring Nina, too? I can't let this selfish behavior go on. I need to confront him and divorce him as soon as possible. As I trembled with anger, Nina spoke softly. Mom, can Dad not see me? What? He couldn't see you either. It seems. Is something wrong with Dad? I... I don't think. I was at a loss for words. Trying to maintain my composure, I responded. No, it's not that he can't see. Then why doesn't Dad answer you, Mom? Can he really not see? It's not like that, I told you. Listen, Mom. I have a good idea. A good idea? <laughs> so listen. What came out of Nina's mouth was a bold plan that even I, as an adult, couldn't have thought of. After hearing Nina's entire plan, I decided to go along with it. We discussed it further and decided to execute the plan starting today. That night, Lloyd came home with a smile, as if the morning sour mood had never happened. He was holding a box of donuts and looking at his phone with a creepy smile. Apparently, he had made up with his affair partner. Feeling good, he probably decided to treat us to some family time as well. Usually he comes home late, but today it was only 7 p.m. Without apologizing for this morning, Lloyd started talking as if nothing had happened. I'm home. I got back early today, so let's have dinner together for a change. Ignoring Lloyd's words, both Nina and I remained silent. His expression froze for a moment, but he continued undeterred. Hey Maya, Nina, how about dinner together? Just as Lloyd was speaking, Nina interrupted to talk to me. Hey Mom, the spaghetti and meatballs for dinner were delicious. Oh, I'm glad you love spaghetti and meatballs, don't you? Ignoring Lloyd, I responded to Nina. Yeah. I love the spaghetti and meatballs you make, Mom. I want to have burgers tomorrow. <laughs> if you say so, I'll make anything you want, Nina. Really? Yay! As if Lloyd wasn't even there, Nina and I continued our conversation, ignoring him. Confused or not, Lloyd just stood there, stunned. Unwilling to accept being ignored, he kept trying to talk to us. Uh, Maya, Nina... I brought some donuts you both love. Hey, Mom, I'm looking forward to going to the amusement park, just the two of us. Yeah, what ride should we go on? Um, I thought I'd go to the amusement park, too. Nina's happy as long as she's with Mom. Nina loves Mom. Thank you, Nina. Mom's happy as long as you're here, too. Hey, both of you, you can hear me, right? Stop ignoring me. Hmm, where did that go? I wonder. I have no idea. Mom's just as clueless. Please, stop ignoring me. For Lloyd, who had been ignoring us as he pleased, being on the receiving end must have been hard to bear. Eventually, with tears in his eyes, he collapsed to his knees in front of us. Seeing Lloyd's pathetic state, Nina said with a smile, Dad! Do you understand how Mom and I feel now? Caught off guard, Lloyd let out a small, uh. Do you know how sad it is to be ignored? You didn't know, did you? I, I. So, I decided if Dad won't answer us, then Mommy and I would do the same to you. It's not nice, is it? 
Unable to counter Nina's logic, Lloyd was speechless. Feeling sorry for him, I told Nina to go to her room for a bit, leaving Lloyd and me alone in the living room. Using Nina like that is low. The moment Nina left, Lloyd started complaining. I handed him something. What, Maya? What is this? Don't you know? It's divorce papers. Why? Why divorce? Why? At this point... You still don't understand how terrible what you've done is? Terrible? I was just tired and didn't feel like responding. In Lloyd's mind, it was just ignoring. Why make a big deal out of it now, when it had been tolerated before? That's probably what he was thinking. But this time was different. He lied to his family, had an affair, and even ignored Nina. For me, that was unforgivable. To Lloyd, who probably still didn't understand his wrongdoing, I said calmly, You may think you just ignored us. I could have tolerated being ignored myself. But you ignored Nina too, didn't you? I, I was just irritable because I had just woken up. Just woken up? Don't you mean had a fight with your affair partner? Uh. Lloyd's face turned pale, and he began to sweat profusely. I spoke clearly to Lloyd. Do you understand the gravity of what you've done? It's far worse than just ignoring me. I'm sorry, but that doesn't mean we have to divorce. Excuse me? You think you can ignore our daughter, lie to your family and cheat, and we'll just continue as a family? You've hurt and betrayed me and Nina. I'm done with you. Stay out of our lives. I grabbed the bags I had packed in advance and left the house with Nina. Lloyd kept begging. Forgive me, it was my fault. But his words fell on deaf ears. Nina also urged. Mom, let's go. No one was on Lloyd's side anymore, not even Nina. Finally, I was able to leave Lloyd. He was reluctant to agree to the divorce, so I hired a lawyer. With solid evidence of his affair, he quickly agreed to the divorce through the lawyer. I also claimed alimony in the divorce settlement, and the lawyer visited the woman Lloyd had an affair with to confirm the facts. As a result, her husband found out about the affair. Apparently, her husband was a scary guy, and Lloyd was chased around by him, who was armed all night. But the story doesn't end there. The husband of Lloyd's affair partner reported the incident to Lloyd's company, since the woman was also a co-worker and both had poor work attitudes, they were fired. I claimed not only the settlement, but also child support from Lloyd. He asked for a reduction, but I flatly refused. I'll make that man, who made our family suffer, pay for what he's done. He got what he deserved. As for me, I moved back to my parents' home with Nina and am now living peaceful days with their support. I consulted with my company and switched to remote work, so now I can spend time with Nina while continuing my job. Mom, let's go shopping soon. All right, just a moment. Tomorrow's breakfast is pancakes. Nina will help too. Then let's make them together. Okay. It may make Nina sad in the future by not having a father around. Even so, I swear in my heart that I will make Nina happy. With that bow, I tightly held little Nina's hand. My name is Karen. I married my husband, whom I met at a university mixer at the age of 22, and we are now in our eighth year of marriage. We both love our jobs and we don't have any children yet. We do have some desire to have kids eventually, but in this day and age, we wanted to work full time as long as we could. Our jobs kept us both busy, and while we couldn't call it a life of misconnections, we both often worked late, and given that we've been together for 12 years since our university days, there wasn't exactly a daily mood of eager baby making. What's more, we currently live in New York, but my husband has told me that he intends to take over his family business in the future so it's decided that we will return to his hometown in rural Nebraska. I had agreed to this. I was starting to think that it was time to start considering our future. 
I was, of course, feeling some pressure due to my age. But for now, I wanted to prioritize my current life as a career woman in the city. I get along well with my husband's parents, and I just had a phone call with my father-in-law the other day. Normally, in-laws would be asking about when we are going to have children, but they don't. Instead, they always show their consideration by saying things like, Karen, our son can be quite selfish, isn't he? Thank you for looking after him. I felt that even if we move to rural Nebraska in the future, we can get along well with his parents. So for now, I was determined to fully enjoy my life and work in the city. Then, one day, as usual, when I returned from work, unusually, my husband had come home earlier. Even when I had to work overtime, I usually return home by 8pm at the latest, including the time I spent shopping for dinner. And no matter how late it gets, I am home by 9pm. But my husband sometimes comes home past midnight, so I couldn't help but blurt out, Oh, that's unusual. That day, I did some shopping at the supermarket and got back home at 9pm. It's rare for my husband to be home at this hour, and the atmosphere was gloomy. He was sitting on the couch, silent and brooding. Had something happened? Welcome home! He doesn't even respond when I talk to him. What's wrong? Are you feeling unwell? I tried talking to my husband, who was sitting on the couch, several times, but he didn't respond, so I decided to start preparing dinner. We rarely had the opportunity to have dinner together, except on special occasions, but I always prepared a light meal that he could have whenever he came home. I was proud of myself for being such a good wife. That day's menu was loaded potato soup, steak, mac and cheese with some broccoli. I'm used to making quick meals, so I whipped it up in no time. Dinner's ready! Upon reflection, it has been quite a while since we sat down and had dinner together. My husband silently moved his food from the plate to his mouth. Hey... His silence throughout the dinner was unnerving. I was getting worried. Had something happened? Could he be cheating? Or was he fired from his job? Or maybe he's feeling unwell due to some illness. Worried, I put my fork down and asked, What's wrong? You're awfully quiet. If something has happened, you should tell me. If there's something you want to say, then say it clearly. I confronted him in a strong tone. Then my husband, with a bitter expression on his face, reluctantly opened his mouth. Well, I have a favor to ask. What? A favor, huh? I had thought he was going to say something bad. I was relieved. As long as it wasn't anything too terrible, I thought I'd listen to his request. You have your parents' place in the countryside, right? Yes. He brought up my parents' place in the countryside out of the blue. I was surprised. Then, shocking words followed. My father's company is... It has incurred some debt. What? Your father's company? My father-in-law runs a large printing company. He has dozens of employees, and my husband's family home is known as a prestigious household in the countryside. Would you mind if we used your family home as collateral? What did you say? Suddenly asked such a thing, I didn't know how to respond. My father is a normal salaried worker. My mother works part-time. My sister is working as a nurse in a local hospital, and somehow the three of them are making ends meet modestly. Even if it's for the sake of my husband's family, why does my parents' house have to serve as collateral? Sorry to say this, but your family's house is... It's normal. Unlike mine, right? Normal. Unlike his. What does that mean? Indeed, compared to the family of my husband, who runs a large local business, we are an ordinary family. In truth, my family is in a tight spot right now. If things keep going this way, we're going to bounce a check for the second time. 
that would lead to bankruptcy. We desperately need a loan of about $500,000. No way. I was shocked by the amount, but I was more surprised by my husband's next words. We come from a special family that runs a business, but your family is just the typical one, after all. Taking a risk wouldn't matter that much, would it? Even if something were to happen, you could always rent an apartment and live there as a family. Everyone in your family is working, right? You guys can manage that, can't you? Excuse me? We come from a family of different social status. There's a huge difference between my family going bankrupt and yours going bankrupt. I'm sorry, but can you hear me out just this once? Do you even realize what you're saying? Ignoring me, my husband continued. I hate to say this, but I could have married a woman of higher status than you. Someone like a wealthy daughter. Why would you say that? Despite that, I married an ordinary woman, like you. You must have been thrilled, right? It's like marrying into money. Be grateful for your luck of marrying a man like me, and listen to me in times like these. It's true that when I married my husband, both of my parents were happy that I was marrying the only son of a business owner. But they were also very apologetic, saying, We somehow feel like we're not on the same level. But I didn't marry my husband because I was aiming for a rich man. We both loved reading, met at a book club, and decided to get married because we found love for each other. But deep down, I couldn't believe he had been thinking like this. My husband's abusive words became more and more harsh. Your sister! Why is she still living in the house she was born in? She's a nurse, isn't she? She should get married and leave home already. If it's just the two of your parents, they can easily rent an apartment. It's cheaper in the countryside. Enough is enough. I started to lose my temper. That house was left to us by our grandparents. And our parents built it, with their sweat and tears, while raising us sisters. You're saying it doesn't matter what happens to it? But my husband wasn't listening anymore. Look, none of that matters. Don't bother me with your small-scale stories. Working to raise you two sisters. Huh. From the beginning, you and I were a mismatch. What? Call it a folly of youth, but during college... I got caught up in love and ended up choosing you. I should have looked at reality more. Even now, we're both working, right? If I had married a more sophisticated lady, I would have had the support of her parents, and she could have been a housewife. Wait, are you even looking down on me for working? And it's not like you're at some top-notch company. You're desperately clinging to a regular job, looking so poor. Do you even know what you look like? You say you're busy with work, I don't know what kind of job that is, but you rush around every morning to bring home such a low salary. You even cut your hair short because of it. You were cute when we first met because you were young, but now you lack charm. How did this conversation about using my family home as collateral end up turning into him badmouthing my family and even my appearance? Even if his emotions are getting the best of him because of his family situation, He's far across the line. Still, my husband went on. Some say working women are attractive, but you're not one of them. I would much prefer a woman who lives a leisurely, elegant life, like my mom. Classy, you know? Why would you say that? I couldn't hold back my anger anymore as my husband began to completely negate me. If you don't want to get divorced, Put up your parents' house as collateral. I'm still young and have the right to choose another woman. It's me who's going to climb up the social ladder from now on. Plus, I'll be the president of the company in town someday. If you don't want to be dumped, just listen to what I say. The man spewing these abusive words in front of me was no longer the husband I knew. What a horrible man he had turned out to be. My family should get saved over yours. I was shocked, realizing that this must have been his true feelings all along. Because my normally quiet husband, 
a man who's usually hard to read was being unusually vocal. Something inside me snapped. Hey, what happened with that matter? My husband asked me one morning. I hadn't spoken to him at all since then. Perhaps he had started to feel rushed, or maybe he had simply decided to stop hiding his true nature after openly expressing his long-held thoughts about me. His attitude remained incredibly arrogant. I'll give you an answer tonight. Upon hearing my response, he left the house. I filled in all the necessary items on the divorce papers I had brought from the city hall, signed them, stamped them, left them on the dining table, and then left the house. That evening, Hey, what's this? What are you trying to do? My husband, who might have expected me to consent to the collateral talk, had come home earlier than me. He was flabbergasted, looking at the divorce papers on the table. You see these papers? I responded coolly. What are you thinking? Now's not the time for this kind of charade. I've told you, my family's in a pinch, haven't I? Are you really that stupid? I ignored his offensive, stupid remark. It hurts to think that my father-in-law's company is in a crisis, but I just couldn't forgive this man for taking advantage of the situation to express his true feeling. You're just an ordinary woman. I should have married a richer daughter. He had been carrying on with our married life all this while, thinking such things. And although he always comes home late, he could come home early in times of emergency. I hadn't noticed, or even thought about it before, but maybe he had had one or two affairs under the guise of work. But at this point, I didn't even care. Once I realized that he had been looking down on me and my family all along, there was no way we could continue our marriage. Hey, don't mess with me. He approached me, his demeanor threatening as if he might strike me, but I didn't flinch. I've made up my mind. Now you need to sign this, too, I calmly stated. After that, I thought there might be a court battle involving lawyers, but in the end, he simply agreed to the divorce after some time. Since I had presented the divorce papers, I quickly packed my things and escaped to a temporary apartment. Perhaps he gave up. Regretting what he'd already spat out was too late. He had clearly insulted me, and not just me, but my family environment as well. What's been said can't be unsaid, and I didn't give him the chance to undo it, because that was his true feelings. After the divorce, I worked hard at the job that my husband had ridiculed as low-paying. Fast forward a few years, on a Saturday afternoon, a day off from work, I got a call from my former father-in-law. The divorce was so sudden, we didn't have the opportunity to discuss anything with my ex-husband's family, because until that incident, I had been nothing but a good daughter-in-law. Ah, Karen, long time no see. Long time no see, father-in-law. I was relieved by the cheerfulness in my father-in-law's voice. Uh, I tried to start the conversation, but my father-in-law interrupted me. I'm sorry about that time. I've heard a lot from my son. Yes, my father-in-law seemed to have completely forgiven my impoliteness. I think you know the situation, but since then, our company has recovered and my son has returned to our hometown to help with the business. Is that so? At least, that was good. Even though they were the family of my divorced husband, I didn't wish misfortune on his parents because they were not the one to be blamed. My former father-in-law continued. Well, basically, my son came crawling back to us. After you divorced him because that hurt his ego so much. And, well, you might not be interested, but I wanted to talk about our son. Yes... I had no choice but to listen, since I couldn't just hang up the phone. Since that time, he's been really down in the dumps. He's simply... unmanageable. Really. 
I don't like speaking ill of my own son like this. But he's got this big attitude. Like, I'm the son of the owner of this company. And he's alienating the employees. His ego has grown even larger since he moved back from New York. And he's just not well-liked at all. I see. He came back out of nowhere and started acting all high and mighty. We don't know what to do with him. I can somewhat imagine the situation. After all, he had such a low opinion of me, his own wife. He probably looks down on the employees of his father's company as mere servants. Several years have passed since then, and he's likely seated as an executive director. His personality has probably warped further, making it impossible to handle him. I see. We caused a lot of trouble for you. Anyway, Karen, this might be odd for me to say, but I hope you find true happiness. I know my son has been a real handful. That's not true at all. I hope you stay well, too. After hanging up the phone, I was relieved to know that his company was doing fine, and I couldn't help but envision what my ex-husband might be like now. But my imagination only lasted for a minute or two. Right after, I received a text from my current boyfriend. I've chosen the restaurant for tonight, here. There was a link to an upscale sushi restaurant in the iMessage. Got it, see you at 6 p.m. I replied and started thinking of what to wear for our date tonight. Since then, I've worked hard and been promoted, and quite unusually for my company, I've made it to the executive's position, a rare achievement for women. My salary has increased considerably from before, and I'm comfortably living on my own. I've been able to save money successfully, and I was even able to gift a new car to my parents back home. My younger sister found a good man, got married, and is living happily in our hometown. And currently, I'm dating a man I met through work with the intention of getting married. He's a kind-hearted and wonderful man who, like me, comes from a normal upbringing. Holly always looks like she's struggling financially, doesn't she? These are my mom friends who look down on me and revel in their sense of superiority. One day, one of their daughters touched my cherished piano without asking, Please don't touch the piano. If you're going to make a fuss over your piano, then take this. After spilling coffee on it, their faces changed when they learned the truth. I am Holly. I enrolled my daughter who just turned three in preschool. At first, she didn't want to be apart from me, but she got used to it within a week. I feel a bit lonely, but I'm happy to see her grow. When I pick her up, she tells me all about her day. She seems to enjoy her daily experiences at preschool. I joined a mom friends group when my daughter started preschool, but honestly, I'm not great at socializing. Still, I have to get along with them for my daughter's sake. There are six of us in the mom friends group, including me. All of us are moms of kids who play well with my daughter. They're all lovely people with deep affection for their children. They're more experienced in parenting, so I learn a lot from them. Above all, they're kind people who accept me, even though I'm not good at communication. However, there's one person I can't get along with. Good morning, Holly. Ah, uh, good morning, Dorothy. Hey, what's with that ugly bag your daughter has? Oh, I made a bag from her old clothes. Seriously? A bag made from old clothes? That's so poor. I'd be embarrassed to let my precious daughter carry that. Your daughter must be trying to be considerate of you. Is that so? Dorothy continued to look down on me with a bitter smile. The mom friend I can't stand is Dorothy. She's the wealthiest mom in the group. She always wears expensive clothes and bags, and she's beautiful with a great figure, the kind of woman everyone admires. But she has a bad personality. She targets people like me, who are not assertive, and looks down on them. I don't have the courage to talk back, 
so I just smile awkwardly. All right, your house is the venue for this week's tea party, isn't it? Yes, it's my turn this week. In the mom friends group led by Dorothy, we have a tea party at someone's home once a week. Although it's mostly just listening to Dorothy brag, I've hosted a tea party at my home several times before. My home is not as stylish as Dorothy's, so she never misses a chance to look down on me. She'd say things like, It's weird not to have any paintings on the wall. Or, Where did you get this tasteless sofa? She even ridiculed my cherished piano. I'm sure I'll be exhausted from forcing smiles while being looked down upon. To be honest, I'm not looking forward to it. After all, it's at your house, Holly. Your furniture is all old and not attractive, but rules are rules, so I'll go. See you later. Dorothy said what she wanted and quickly left the preschool. After parting with her, I felt heavy thinking about the upcoming tea party. On the day of the tea party, as the other mom friends entered my home, Dorothy came in last. Today, she looked even more stylish than usual. Dorothy stands out in my modest home, looking out of place. Wow, you still have all this old furniture. I gave so much advice last time. Why don't you replace this sofa already? Oh, I forgot. You can't afford it, Holly. <laughs> Ignoring Dorothy's arrogance, I started preparing tea and snacks in the kitchen. The other mom friends are chatting in their seats, but Dorothy is walking around the house alone. I wish she wouldn't snoop around. It's embarrassing. Oh, Holly, you still have this old piano? Hearing Dorothy's loud voice, I rushed to the scene. She had entered my piano room without permission. I had put a do not enter sticker on the door to that room, but Dorothy seemed to have ignored it. The other mom friends, hearing her voice, started gathering in the room. Sorry everyone, could you please not go near the piano in that room? Dorothy frowned at my timid request. What? Why would you say that? That's not how you treat guests. I apologize, but... That piano is very precious to me. Even a small scratch would be a big deal. Please, please understand. A scratch? It's already an old piano. What's one more scratch? You really are like a poor person. Cherishing something like this. Sorry, the tea is ready. Let's relax in the living room. Somehow, calming Dorothy down, we return to the living room with the other mom friends. Dorothy seemed displeased about being corrected. She left looking irritated without even finishing her tea or snacks. I worry this might affect my daughter's friendships, but she never came home crying. For now, I was relieved. But Dorothy's arrogance escalated. She spread false rumors among the mom friends and flaunted her expensive clothes and bags. She even looked down on my husband's income and my daughter's appearance. I don't mind being looked down upon, but it's uncomfortable when she speaks ill of my daughter and husband. I told her to stop, but it didn't seem to have much effect. A month passed like this, and it was my turn to host the tea party again. I welcomed the usual mom friends, but Dorothy hadn't arrived yet. According to the others, she would be late. We decided to start the tea party without her. Without someone bragging, it was surprisingly peaceful. I was talking without tension for the first time in. But she never came home crying. It was probably Dorothy. I got up and opened the door. Sorry, I'm late. I was picking up my daughter from daycare. Dorothy was holding a little girl about two years old. Thank you for coming, Dorothy. Is your daughter joining us? Do you have a problem with that? No, I just wasn't expecting it. It's none of your business. Let us in. Ah, uh, sure. Sorry. Dorothy's daughter ran into the house as soon as they entered. As I tried to stop her, Dorothy pulled my arm. She's fine on her own. She's a good girl. But what if she gets hurt? Do you have anything dangerous lying around? No, but since you're here, 
Dorothy, how about we have lunch? Would your daughter like to join? Wow, you're actually being considerate. However, Dorothy only called her daughter's name and didn't try to bring her to the living room. She left her daughter unattended and went to the living room where the mom friends were waiting. I managed to catch Dorothy's running daughter and took her to the living room. I handed her to Dorothy and started preparing lunch. As I was bringing the prepared dishes to the living room, I heard a noise from the hallway. I had a bad feeling and went to check. Dorothy's daughter was pulling out my daughter's toys and playing with them. Sorry, these are my daughter's favorite toys. Let's put them back where they were. As I gently spoke to her and tried to take the toy, she dropped it and started scribbling on the wall with crayons. I grabbed her arm in a panic and she burst into tears. Hearing her cries, Dorothy and the mom friends rushed to the hallway. What are you doing, Holly? Making my daughter cry. She was just playing. I'm sorry, but she was drawing on the wall. She is a child. Let her doodle. It's not a big deal. But we're renting, so we'd have to pay for repairs. Ah, you really are like a poor person. That's a small expense. You should have been prepared for this when you had a child. Poor thing. She was having fun. Dorothy starts lecturing me instead of scolding her daughter. The other mom friends just look the other way, not daring to oppose Dorothy. I give up on reasoning with her and decide to focus on lunch. As usual, she complains about my cooking, calling it bland, tasteless, and inedible. I thought I made a good meal, but today, it just doesn't go down well. Just when Dorothy's bragging session starts, I hear the sound of a piano. I rush to the piano room, and as expected, Dorothy's daughter is playing it. I had left the piano lid open and forgot to lock the room. Stop! Don't touch that! I raise my voice, and characteristically, I pick up her daughter and usher her out of the room. Dorothy rushes in, hearing her daughter cry. Holly, what's the problem? Why are you making my daughter cry? Please, just don't touch the piano. It's really important to me. I bow my head, but Dorothy seems displeased. What's the big deal? It's just an old piano. She splashes her bottled coffee all over the piano. Ah, ah. I try to wipe it off with my clothes, but it's too late. The coffee seeps into the white case and flows deeper into the strings. I collapse to my knees, realizing there's nothing I can do. The other mom friends rush in, asking what happened. I don't have the energy to answer. Instead, Dorothy gleefully recounts the events. Holly interrupted my daughter while she was happily playing the piano and made her cry. I didn't like her for a while and she became obsessed with playing the piano, so I poured coffee on her and pretended I never made her cry. Mom friends wondering which one to follow. One of the mom friends interrupts. Wait, this piano, it's worth over a million dollars. She mumbles and turns pale. Oh, what's wrong? Why that long face? Is it about this old piano? This piano is worth over a million dollars. It's a rare piece, one of only a few in the world. She's right. This piano was purchased by my grandmother. It's a limited edition worth about a million dollars. I had promised to keep it safe for generations. I never thought it would be ruined like this. You're lying, Holly. How could someone like you own such a valuable piano? Speak up! Say it's a lie! No, it's not a lie. This is a cherished piano passed down from my grandmother. I warned you not to touch it before. If Dorothy spilled coffee on it, then she'll have to pay for the repairs. That would be around $100,000. $100,000? I can't afford that. Besides, it's Holly's fault for not telling me it was valuable. Dorothy tries to make excuses, but realizes her position. She apologizes profusely. I'm so sorry, Holly. I had no idea that old piano was so valuable. I'm truly sorry. Please don't bill me for the repairs. She had always looked down on me and acted arrogantly. 
Is she really sorry? I think about her past behavior. She's always looked down on me, brought her daughter without notice, and let her play without supervision. She even lectured me for interrupting her daughter's playtime. Dorothy said, if you had told me it was valuable, but you don't spill coffee on something someone cherishes, valuable or not, I can't forgive her. Stop apologizing, Dorothy. She looks up at me. Hopeful, I will tell her that. I'll send you the bill for the repairs. Please take your daughter and leave. What? She stands there, stunned. I point to the door, and the other mom friend escort her out. The tea party ends. I later bill Dorothy for the repairs. Her husband visits and apologizes. Apparently, her attitude had been a problem for a while. He says he is being looked at in a negative light because of this incident. She starts working to pay off the debt and stops attending tea parties. I make sure to lock the piano room from then on. Since then, the piano has been beautifully restored and in order to prevent such a tragedy from happening again, he has developed a habit of turning the doorknob to make sure the room is securely locked. I resent my inability and wish I had done this from the beginning. Years pass and my daughter grows up. I pass on the piano to her, knowing she'll take good care of it. My name is Chloe and I'm 44 years old. I'm about to share a pivotal, rather dramatic moment in my life and I'd like you to listen in. When I was 25, I met and married Ethan, a hard-working businessman, thanks to a mutual acquaintance. I'd always hoped to become a full-time homemaker after our marriage, but given the economic downtown, that plan didn't pan out. Instead, I continued to work at the salon where I'd been employed for a while, leveraging maternity and postpartum leaves to welcome and nurture our daughter, Isabella. Up until this point, we had an ordinary family life, like everyone else. In retrospect, as a first-time mom, there were days that felt exhausting. Yet, each day brought along a new joy. Isabella was so adorable and Ethan was incredibly sweet. Our family didn't experience the typical mother-in-law and daughter-in-law conflicts. On the contrary, my in-laws showered Isabella with so much love and even helped us with her upbringing. So, I don't recall ever feeling overwhelmed. Surrounded by kind people, I thought we were living a calm and peaceful life. By the time Isabella turned 10, Ethan and I had become a pretty solid, well-settled couple. The lovey-dovey phase was fading, but that didn't worry me. Let's admit it, I saw it as natural evolution of our relationship, something every couple goes through. Ethan, ever the kind-hearted man, would pick me up from work whenever our schedules aligned. So, the thought of our love cooling off never crossed my mind. There was no room for anxiety, until one unexpected day. Ethan was off work, so I borrowed our car for a shopping run. As I slid into the driver's seat and adjusted the side mirror to suit my view, something glittery at my feet caught my attention. Picking it up, I realized it was a dangly earring. Obviously, designed for women. For the record, I don't wear earrings. I can't because I have allergies. Wait, if this isn't mine, whose is it? My mind was instantly flooded with question marks. And the most direct answer it could muster was infidelity. No, 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 no. Cheaters don't get caught this easily, right? Still, I decided to confront Ethan nonchalantly, showing him the earring I'd found in the car. He looked startled for a moment. Then he quickly recovered, saying, Ah, oh yes! I gave one of my colleagues a ride the other day. It must be hers. What's the reaction now? But did he just almost say mine? No way, right? I was unsure whether to press further. I had a nagging feeling of unease, but part of me wanted to erase my unwelcome thoughts. Most importantly, Isabella was with us. 
I didn't want to risk a confrontation that could potentially confirm Ethan's infidelity and hurt our daughter. So, I chose to let it slide for the time being. A few days later, on a particularly stormy night, Ethan had to attend a business dinner. He called to let me know he probably wouldn't make it home. In this weather, are you sure you'll be okay? Don't catch a cold. I couldn't help but express my concern. Ethan is prone to catching colds, so I knew it must be an important event to drag him out on a night like this. Yeah, I'll be fine. Thanks. But just as he finished, a shrill, sweet voice echoed from the other end of the phone. Ethan, are you still on the phone? I couldn't help but ask again. Huh? No, I told you, I'm on a call. Ethan tries to justify himself while stopping me. What just happened there? You got called by your first name? Well, it's one of our clients. You know how bosses love to call you by your first name. You know what I mean. Hmm, that sounds like an excuse to me. I do have a manager at another store who calls out to me, Hey Chloe, I guess there are a good number of bosses who prefer to use first names regardless of gender. But there is something off about the tone of his voice. That makes me suspicious. I mutter, hmm, without realizing. Perhaps, scared of being questioned further, Ethan quickly hangs up to call. I'm off for an entertaining night with clients, gotta go. The last time, I found a piece of jewelry that wasn't mine. This time, the smell of infidelity seems to be getting stronger. I'm not saying it doesn't hurt, but without any solid evidence, I don't truly feel like he's cheating on me. All I feel is a formless, nagging doubt growing within me. The next morning, Ethan returns home and starts talking about his difficult night, even though I didn't ask. But if you listen closely, he keeps repeating words like forceful, already settled, and wanted to go home early. The common theme seems to be that he didn't really want to go in the first place. Hmm, that just makes it all the more suspicious. So, you're not cheating on me, right? Just kidding. I was about to follow up with a laugh and say, just kidding, of course you're not. But then I saw Ethan's face and fell silent. He was pale as a ghost. I'd never seen anyone turn that pale before. So that's what it looks like when someone turns blue, I thought to myself. No, of course not. There's no way I would ever do something like that. His words don't match the color of his face. While his expressions might be able to lie, his complexion doesn't. Now, he's a prime suspect. What an awful joke I've made. I screwed up. Trying to hide the tears welling up in my eyes, I turned my back on Ethan. Come on, go take a bath, it's your day off, you should take it easy. I left the room with my best attempt at a cherry voice, then I cried alone. His bad lying made the whole thing seem unreal until now. I kept thinking, there is no concrete evidence anyway, but the suspicion is very real. There is still no evidence, nothing has really changed, but his reaction, there is no mistaking it. You don't even need intuition to see it. What am I supposed to do from here? Should I find evidence and file for divorce? What about our daughter, Isabella? Can I raise her alone? I still love Ethan, after everything. I couldn't make up my mind, so I decided to think more about what I really want. And so, with no answer in sight, Isabella started her summer break. I thought it would be just like any other summer, but it wasn't. Ethan kept insisting on taking Isabella to his parents' house. He usually doesn't want to go because it's a hassle, and since it's just in the next town, we can go anytime. And during summer break, I'm usually busy with work. When we visit his parents, we usually stay for a few days. Even though they are close by, the time Isabella can spend with her grandparents is limited. But I can't take consecutive days off during this period. Does he know that and still ask anyway? As I ponder it, 
I remembered that this summer was different from all the rest. Right, Ethan is having an affair. Could he possibly be using the trip home as an excuse to do something? If I'm lucky, could I obtain evidence of his affair? With these thoughts in mind, and feeling that I couldn't decide my course of action without proof, I allowed Isabella and Ethan to make the trip home together. The day they left, Ethan, grinning more than usual, said, We are off, as he drove Isabella to his parents' house. That's suspicious. He usually seems so much more bothered. But with no idea of what might actually happen, and the distance to his parents' house being a significant obstacle, obtaining evidence wasn't going to be easy. After sending them off, I rummaged around the house but found nothing. I knew it wouldn't be that simple. As I was exchanging voice messages with Isabella via the GPS, I was about to give up on finding any proof. The next day, after searching all night for evidence and not finding any, I went to work with a tired face from the lack of sleep. Everyone was worried about me, but I brushed them off with a laugh, saying, The heat kept me awake. As I exchanged messages with Isabella during my work breaks, I was expecting another fruitless day. But then, I noticed something odd. Although Isabella was supposed to be at her in-laws, the GPS was acting strangely. It was moving. Sure, she might go somewhere, but the GPS showed Isabella heading towards a street lined with pubs. I had a bad feeling about this. In a rush, I told my manager, I'm not feeling well, and decided to leave work early. While I was doing that, the GPS stopped at a shop in the city. The name of the shop was Amore Club, Love and Me. This is a romantic hotel. Isabella brought the GPS to a hotel? What? I was confused. What if she was involved in some kind of trouble? Isabella hadn't responded to the messages I had sent her yet, so in a panic I called Ethan's parents' house. Hello, I'm sorry for the sudden call. Is Isabella there? I didn't know if Ethan's mother, father or even Ethan himself had answered the phone. Chloe? Isabella just left with my son to go play. What's the matter? You sound so panicked. The person on the other end was Ethan's father. Hearing that Ethan and Isabella had left together, I felt a wave of relief. I'm glad she's safe. But as soon as the relief washed over me, a question popped up in my mind. Why is Ethan at a hotel with Isabella? Could this be the evidence I've been looking for? Just as I was thinking this, I got a reply from Isabella on the GPS. I told Ethan's father, Can I call you back later? And abruptly ended the call. Then I quickly responded to Isabella. What are you doing now? I'm waiting in the car for dad. I checked the GPS location again in case I was mistaken. It's still the hotel. No matter how many times I look, it's the hotel. Did he just abandon Isabella in the parking lot of the hotel? I felt myself losing control. More than having definite proof of the affair, the fact that he brought Isabella to such a place was unbearable. Ethan's father had said that Ethan took Isabella out saying he was going to have some fun. So, he was using Isabella as a cover-up. I can't believe how foolish he's been. This definitely calls for... No, needs a consequence. I messaged Isabella. Mommy is coming to join you there. Then I called my father-in-law back and told him everything. He adores Isabella and was furious. Just hearing Ethan seems to be at the hotel with Isabella, he blurted out. What on earth is he doing? Thinking about her father and his mistress at a hotel. If Isabella understood what that meant, she'd definitely be upset. Before Isabella realized anything, my in-laws and I decided to remove her from the situation. Luckily, the hotel was near a station, so I hopped on the train while my in-laws drove there. As we entered the hotel's parking lot, sure enough, 
our car was parked. Isabella, who knew we were coming, was innocently waving from inside the car. I quickly unlocked the car with my spare key and hugged Isabella. I'm sorry for leaving you alone here. But I'm not alone, Daddy is just late. Isabella pouted, promising a fun day out and then making her wait in the parking lot wasn't right. It was awful. Mummy will make sure he pays for it. I didn't say it out loud, but I promised Isabella. For now, I convinced Isabella to go home with my in-laws. I wanted to get her away from there as soon as possible, so the teamwork with my in-laws was appreciated. Then I climbed into the driver's seat of Ethan's car and waited. Of course, just waiting wasn't fun at all. I figured they were in the middle of it, so I called Ethan on purpose to disturb them. Hello, is that you? I intentionally used a late back tone to gauge Ethan's situation. Hey, I'm driving right now. Don't call me out of the blue. Call me later. Oh, your car's right here. What exactly are you driving, I wonder? I couldn't help but chuckle. Oh, okay, gotcha. Your parents will be there to pick her up soon. Just letting you know. What? Of course, it was a lie. Because my in-laws had just left. Knowing he was having fun in the hotel room made me so mad. I thought this was the best way to wrap it up quickly. I hung up and not long after, Ethan rushed out to the parking lot. With a woman trailing behind him, her hair all messed up. They seemed to be in a bit of squabble. Well, that makes sense. He probably intended to be in the room for at least three hours. My call likely forced him to interrupt his rendezvous and he had to rush out of the room. Or rather, he absolutely had to. As Ethan approached the car, his shirt buttons were haphazardly fastened. Was he planning to meet my in-laws looking like that? Isabella would surely be surprised. The woman seemed furious. And I started to think that this might be the end of their affair. Moreover, I could be imagining it. But the woman looked a bit like me from the past. Well, well, interesting choice for an affair, a woman of a similar type. The whole situation was starting to amuse me. So I waited in the car, grinning as I met Ethan's eyes. When Ethan noticed me, he was taken aback for a moment. Then, his mouth began to open and close like a goldfish out of water. I'm here to pick you up, dear, I called, swinging the car door open with a smile. Ethan stared at me in surprise, raising his hand as if on autopilot. I had to chuckle. It was just like a dog sitting or drooling at the sight of a treat. Pavlov's dog. Classic conditioned response. The woman next to him turned from furious red to terrified pale and secured off. Poor thing, left all alone, I thought. Why, huh? W what? Wait! Ethan stammered, pointing at me and repeating his surprise. I didn't respond, simply returning his shock with a smile. He remained frozen even when I started the car. No objections then. Well, you can walk home then, I'm going ahead. I declared and drove off. A guy who abandons Isabella in the parking lot deserves the same. Serves you right, think about what you've done. I saw Ethan chasing the car in the rear view mirror but I didn't slow down. His lover seemed to have left already, leaving no one to rescue him. Now, I guess I'll just wait for you back at home. Driving back to my in-laws, the whole situation seemed amusing. My mother-in-law was playing with Isabella when I arrived. My father-in-law looked positively livid, veins popping on his forehead. This place is hell, I thought as Ethan finally trudged home. It had taken him five hours to walk back from the hotel. A distance that should have taken about two. He must have really dreaded coming back. I'm... I'm home. Ethan 
mumbled as he timidly stepped inside. My father-in-law shot him at a fierce glare. Who the hell are you? You don't have permission to enter. Get out! Well, wait! That, please! Before Ethan could finish his plea, my father-in-law yanked his arm so hard I thought his shoulder might dislocate and throw him. I felt grateful for my father-in-law in that moment. Ethan always said that his father was scary when angry, so I knew this would have a greater impact than on my own anger. Hand over the car keys! Ethan, completely bewildered, handed over the keys. My father-in-law began his interrogation. Where were you today, leaving Isabella behind? I'm asking you, where were you? At, 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 at a hotel. He couldn't even stand up. I know that already. With whom were you? Don't tell me you were alone. Speak up. If you lie, I'll leave you out there all night. My father-in-law is not one to make empty threats. He took the keys so Ethan couldn't escape in the car. Sweat began to pour from Ethan. Thought it wasn't particularly hot. Cold sweat, I suppose. She's a... She's a temp at the office. Ethan mumbled, then fell silent. Speak up. If I have to keep asking you, I'll throw you out. Terrified, I thought, but I was smiling behind my father-in-law. In a whimpering voice, Ethan started to confess. He said he found the temp cute and just wanted to chat a little. But she was much more receptive than he expected and before he knew it, they were involved. Flattered by the attention of a younger woman, he got carried away and lost control of the situation. Ethan spilled his guts every last detail. I have to admit, I was somewhat pleased when he said, I found the temp attractive. Probably because she reminded me of myself. I felt like it was a roundabout compliment. But that doesn't mean I'm about to forgive him. I had a pretty good idea of what I wanted to do. I understand. Call her now. Tell her it's over. With his back against the wall, Ethan did as he was told and dialed her number. Uh, hey, it's me. I'm sorry about... Um, the lunch. The moment the call connected, Ethan stuttered, unsure of how to start the conversation. But then, a voice roared through the phone. I've had enough of you! And there was a beep beep of disconnection. She just broke up with me. I thought to myself, you didn't break up with her, she dumped you. Poor Ethan. You didn't initiate the breakup, it was because you lacked sincerity. You are truly indecisive. My father-in-law scolded Ethan, making him shrink even more. Do you realize how bad you've been to Chloe and Isabella? When he yelled this, Ethan finally responded loudly. Of course I do. I want to strip this guy naked and throw him out, but what does Chloe want? Cut off guard by the question, I took a moment to think. Honestly, I didn't want to break up. I believe I can live happily with just Isabella and me, but I do love Ethan. The only other thing that came to mind was that I never want him to cheat again. Divorce. The moment I muttered the word, Ethan jolted, his shoulders shaking. Please, anything but divorce. I was wrong. I betrayed you and Isabella. I was the worst. Well, he's not wrong there. He's just stating the obvious. Thought it did amuse me slightly. He repeated, I'm so sorry, again and again. Offering a deep apology. His face was hidden as he bowed loud to the floor but I could tell from his voice he was sobbing. I'll never cheat again, he pleaded, to which I finally replied. Sign the divorce papers, I'll keep them. Depending on your behavior, I can file them at any moment. At my words, Ethan lifted his head. 
perhaps thinking he had dodged a bullet. And you are on an allowance from now on. Only enough for lunch, and you'll do the housework. Ethan's face, which had momentarily brightened, dimmed slightly. Also, we are putting GPS on your phone, and you're not allowed to go out alone with Isabella. Either I or your father will accompany you. I continued laying out the terms. Go immediately when I ask you to shop. Fulfill all my requests. Oh yes, when I say housework, I mean everything from taking out the trash in the morning, shopping, cleaning, preparing dinner, to doing the laundry for the next morning. It's an all-day task. In other words, he'd have to become our own personal errand boy. There's no dignity as a husband or a father in that. If that's okay with you, then I won't divorce you. But remember, this isn't valid if I'm upset. I can't believe the audacity of what I'm saying. I'm basically telling him to keep me pleased all the time. But in the end, he's the one at fault. This much should be permissible. If he's busy, he won't have the time or the mind to cheat, right? Ethan, with a tearful expression, agreed, saying, I'm fine with that. Immediately, my father-in-law interjected, Not I'm fine with that, but thank you for going that far for me, right? As advised, Ethan corrected himself. It seemed like I had completely exploited his weakness and didn't allow him any say. Six years have passed since then. I still keep the divorce papers locked in a drawer, out of Ethan's reach. Ethan doesn't seem to be showing any signs of cheating either. Rather than trying to keep me happy, it seems to have become a natural part of him. No wonder, our teenager daughter, Isabella, still mocks him saying, your actions back then were just unthinkable. Ethan seemed to find being disliked by Isabella several times more painful than being scolded by my father-in-law or me. As Isabella grew, his determination to be a better husband became more and more apparent. Thanks to that, I am happy. Don't misunderstand. It's not that I have forgiven Ethan for his one-time mistake. The agreement I made with Ethan at that time, to not divorce him, was to protect my own happiness. My ultimate goal was for the three of us in this family to live harmoniously. Even if Ethan had wanted to break up, the conclusion would have been the same. I had no intention to divorce, even if it meant binding a resistant Ethan. However, as long as he fears being served divorce papers, I suppose it's okay to think that we're in love. Now, Ethan cherishes our family, not because he's bound to me, but of his own accord. That's why this story is about the most challenging time in my life. Looking at my family now, I can confidently say that such a thing will never happen again. As evidence, I'm very happy now. I want everyone listening to this to know. Don't think you can easily destroy the family I've built. Even if the world turns upside down, I won't let go of Ethan, just so you know.